This is Taking Stock on Bloomberg. I'm Pim Fox. We are covering the 8.9 magnitude earthquake that struck in Japan earlier yesterday. It is already Saturday morning in Japan. And here now to tell us more about the geography, the oceanography, the power of nature, uh, we have with us Bruce Parker of the Stevens Institute of Technology joining us from our studio in Washington. Uh, Bruce uh, Parker, good to have you with us on Bloomberg. In the context of many of the other earthquakes that we've reported on in the last 24 months, the earthquake in Chile, uh, the earthquake that took place recently in New Zealand, how powerful is an 8.9 magnitude earthquake? Well, it's, it's obviously very powerful, but there's another aspect to it besides just the power of the earthquake itself, because you can have powerful earthquakes, even underwater earthquakes, that may not cause large tsunamis. It has to be the way that the seafloor is moved by that earthquake. And if you have a, a large vertical movement of the seabed that displaces huge amounts of water, that's what's going to cause the tsunami. And in some cases, that doesn't happen. In fact, most um, um, earthquakes don't cause tsunamis, and even the big ones may not cause large tsunamis. It, it, it really depends on how the movement of the seabed is caused. Bruce Parker, based on your experience and what you know about the situation in Japan right now, should we expect more tremors, more aftershocks? I mean, you're probably going to get more aftershocks. I mean, if you remember after the 2004 tsunami, and there hadn't been a large submarine earthquake there for literally decades, and then the following years after it, there were some aftershocks, some of which were large enough to be considered, you know, decent-sized earthquakes by themselves. The aftershocks so far on this one, I think there was a 6.91 or something like that, and those numbers sound close, but they're orders of magnitude lower because of the scale that they use. And so the aftershocks are not likely to cause more tsunamis. I think the tsunamis themselves, the worst ones, are probably over. Bruce, alternative forms of energy, we know that they include wind power and the location of those wind turbines offshore in deep water, in shallow water. Is there a problem with that kind of technology? Because it seems awful hard to guard against these kinds of earthquakes and the ensuing tsunamis. It's still probably infrequent enough that, you know, the chances of your wind farm being hit are probably not very great. And in terms, and that's in terms of the earthquake itself. In terms of the tsunami and the deeper the water, the safer it is, because tsunamis in deep water actually are not very high. They have very long wavelengths. It's only when they propagate into, short, into shallow water and they shorten and they steepen and they get larger. And then other th factors come into play, like the bathymetry, the shape of the bottom. There are places, for example, where you may have a submarine ridge leading into a point of land. That energy tends to be focused there. But in a, a deep water um, canyon, for example, it won't be very high there because it's refracted away from there. So there's a, a lot of shoreline and bathymetric effects that may make it actually very large in one place, a few miles down the coast, not as large. There's, there's many factors. Bruce Parker, I'm sure you've been listening to the reports having to do with the nuclear power plant uh, that is in the prefecture, Miyagi prefecture, uh, that uh, is, uh, well, not cooling in, in the way it is supposed to cool. Uh, is there a way to protect these kinds of large installations from these, uh, these catastrophes, these uh, earthquakes, or should they just not be built in those locations? Again, you have to kind of separate the earthquake from the tsunami. Um, a, a relatively strong large seawall will protect you from most tsunamis. In terms of the earthquake itself, of course, where are you going to put it in Japan that's immune to earthquakes? It's, it's a very volatile area. Um, and as much as you try to study the geology, it's so, I mean, we, obviously we can't predict earthquakes at the moment. So the earthquake part's the difficult part. The tsunami part, if you've got a, a power plant, you can certainly build a, a strong seawall, and you can maybe decide to where you should put it. Would not be like um, on a point of land, but more at the end of a of a deep seawater canyon where the tsunami won't be as large. So there, there are things you can do in terms of minimizing the tsunami danger. Uh, Bruce, uh, you know when you talk about the power that is unleashed by the earthquake uh, and the resulting uh, tsunami. 
Has the technology kept pace with our understanding of these natural forces? Has the Japanese infrastructure for building, for architecture, for engineering, is that some of the most advanced in the world? Um, I would say so. I mean, the Japanese are, have the most tsunami awareness, the most familiarity with how to deal with the earthquakes and the tsunamis as, as anybody in the world. Certainly, Hawaiians and the tsunami warning centers in Hawaii are, are about the same level as well. Um, they, they basically, I think, can do almost anything, everything they can, perhaps. And again, you have to separate the earthquake part from the tsunami part. And the earthquake part, because it's still so unpredictable, is maybe the more difficult one to handle. And there are, as I said, there are things you can do to minimize a tsunami hitting your plant or, um, I'm sorry, the earplug just fell out of my ear. That's all right. All right. I want to thank you very much, Bruce Parker from the Stevens Institute of Technology. He is the author of The Power of the Sea, reporting to us from Washington, D.C.